Hare Krishna. So today morning we are discussing from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the third canto, the section about Kapila's teachings. Here Devahuti is beginning her inquiries from her son Kapila, who is a manifestation of the Lord. And there the mode in which before actually before that happens now the mode in which uh, Devahuti serves her husband Kardama that is described so I'll s focus on a particular theme this whole topic can be the description of how a wife should serve a husband that can be quite triggering in today's world so I will talk on the theme of the role of hierarchy in bhakti. Mm -hmm. So how important is hierarchy? Why is it important? And how is it to be understood in today's world? Mm -hmm. Now at one level, if we look, have a cursory look at Srila Prabhupada's teachings, things can seem very hierarchical. Say for example, the authority figure is the guru and the disciple. Mm -hmm. And uh, it said that the disciples sh should be ready to change their life completely to satisfy the guru. And yes, the prasada, bhagavad prasada, that it is only in pleasing the guru that we can make spiritual advancement. Mm -hmm. And while well, this is something which is true, but the question is, is this the only truth? Now we can look at both Shastra and we can look at Guru. Now if you look at Shastra, let's consider one example which is very much there in the Bhagavatam itself, Narada and Dhruva. Now here we will see that the hierarchy is not emphasized that much. Dhruva is wounded, devastated by the harsh words that his stepmother has spoken to him and he leaves home in search of God. And when he meets Narad Muni on the way, Narad Muni tells him, don't take this insult so seriously. You're a small child and children some fight, sometimes fight. The children have squabbles and they say, I will never talk with you again. Hmm? And then a couple of late days later, they are playing again. You know, oh, he or she is my BFF, best friend forever. They don't take quarrels so seriously. And he says that if you think you are not a child, if you think that you are an advanced person, then people who are evolved, people who are wise, they also don't take quarrels so seriously. You know, they understand honor, dishonor, these things just come and go. So, he says, just go back home and live peacefully, things will be settled. So, what does Dhruva reply? He's just a five-year-old child over here, he says, your words are true, but they find no place in my heart. Because my heart has been wounded. He said, I need a kingdom. And a kingdom bigger than my father. If you can help me find that kingdom, Please guide me. Otherwise, let me go on my way. Now, Narad Muni does not take this as a personal affront. Who do you think you are challenging my authority? Don't you know that I am the Guru of Yas Dev? You know, you are just a kid. You know, I have lived for more millennia than what you have lived for years. Now, he does not at all go in that direction. In fact, uh, he appreciates, and there is a verse over there which is very striking. He says, Ahok Kshatriya Tejasam Maan Bhangam Amrushyatam. That just consider the glory of the Kshatriyas that they cannot tolerate dishonor. And we say, you know, we should all be ready to be humble, humble and tolerant. And he is not condemning, he is appreciating. 
So the idea is that Kshatriyas, by the, their inability to tolerate dishonor, that does not mean that they attack those who have dishonored them, but that inspires them to always act honorably. So, intolerance of dishonor or inability to tolerate dishonor. This can make them vindictive and they can say, destroy anyone who dishonors. Now that is what can happen. But this is not the direction in Kshatriyas are supposed to go. Instead, they avoid zealously any action on their part that will be dishonorable. So in this way, the inability to tolerate dishonor is a feature of Kshatriya psychology. And Narad Muni accommodates that. He doesn't say that you, you, just, you didn't obey me, get lost. Now Narad Muni gives him a way. So it could be considered rebellious, but it's not rebellious. He's just being honest. He's being candid. This is where I am at. He says that, you know, that the words you have spoken are true, but I am not at that level. I, I, they don't find a place in my heart. So Narad Muni basically gives him two levels. He says, you are a child or you can be a saint. Hmm? He says, as a child, don't take insult so seriously. In, uh, so, both child and saint, don't take insult seriously. Hmm? But what he says, Dhruva says is, I am in between. I have a Kshatriya Psyche. Although I am a child, but I have Kshatriya Psyche. And dishonor is unbearable. Krishna also talks about this in 134 in the Bhagavad Gita. Sambhavita sichakirtir maranaditir ichyate. For one who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. So the point I am making over here is that hierarchy is not the sole thing that is insisted on. Hmm? The important thing is spirituality. That when, uh, Narad, when Narada doesn't say, you have to obey me. He says, okay, this is where you are at. Then this is a path for you from where you are. So, now, there is some extent we can say hierarchy is there in the sense that Narad Muni gives guidance and uh, Dhruva follows. But it is not an absolute top down. It is not just, uh, it's not just like a domination. It is more of discussion. It's like, okay, if you can't do this, then you can do this. So there's a discussion over there. So, and we see this similar mood in, in Shila Prabhupada also. When Shila Prabhupada started our movement, uh, it began in New York. And then after that, came to the other coast, San Francisco. And if you look carefully at the way the devotees practiced, Overall, New York was much more conservative at that time. You know, the devotees were involved were much more strictly following rules. Mm. Whereas the devotees who came to San Francisco, they, Sham Sundar Prabhu, Mukund Maharaj, they were much more liberal, relatively speaking. Their focus was not so much on following the rules so strictly as it was in doing broad outreach, doing big programs. And Prabhupada accepted and valued both. Now, of course, if somebody went too much beyond boundaries, Prabhupada would uh, put his foot down. But Pra Prabhupada was not simply hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we could see this is in the 1960s. And then if you look at it in the 1970s, mm -hmm. You see, Shla, at that time, Shla Prabhupada with his disciples and Shla Prabhupada with his life members. Now, the life members, in India especially, they were already elderly people, well established in society. Many of them had their own spiritual affiliations 
many of them were gurus of uh, well, not disciples of advaitic gurus and prabhupad's mode of interaction with them was not the way he interacted with the disciples with his disciples mostly he gave them instructions but with the life members it was much more of engagement so they were at a particular place in their lives while prabhupad would sometimes confront them with respect to impersonal readings but prabhupad did not focus so much on that prabhupad engaged them they contributed financially they used their contacts they got things moving in india so that the temples could be built so in that sense prabhupad was pragmatic about how people could be engaged now why am i talking about hierarchy over here i'm giving this broad picture because the topic here is gender hierarchy that the way it is being talked about is that the wife should serve the husband and prabhupad did talk about that many places in his books but at the th- same time when prabhupad engaged devotees no he en- encouraged and engaged everyone mm-hmm. so the, when he engaged everyone his focus was those that everybody should be enthused to practice bhakti that everybody should have the opportunity to connect with krishna now so the so the way says the prabhupada dealt with women in india who were born and brought up in a particular culture where gender roles were clearly defined and divided and the way prabhupad dealt with women is female disciples in america where the gender roles were more diffuse mm-hmm. uh, and so prabhupad's dealings were different in india the gender roles were were more defined and divided prabhupad's dealings were different in the west especially in america the gender roles were more diffuse they were not dire- that that uh, defined or divided they were more interchangeable you could say not exactly interchangeable they were more more diffuse and uh, mixed to some extent and prabhupada engaged devotees the point was prabhupada when he talked about protection the point of protection was not restriction so much as facilitation that everybody needs to be facilitated in their service mm-hmm. and not so much restricted restriction will lead a person to feel suffocated and then they will go away so i'll take a broader picture now about this in the bhagavatam also there is the description that according to desha kal vibhagavit that according to time place circumstance things need to be explained so that this same desh kal vibhav bhagavit that time place circumstance this comes twice in the teachings of narad muni that i quoted and it also comes in bhishma's interactions in the first canto so let's try to see from a broader perspective what is the role of hierarchy mm-hmm. and uh, how important hierarchy is so the what i talked about till now is that hierarchy is important but it is not rigid it is flexible according to time place circumstance so now look at broadly see there is there have been different political philosophies throughout history now political philosophy means the idea about how states should be organized how go- administration should be run and what would be the driving or defining value for that so now there are many political philosophies i'll focus on three to understand explain their defining values and then we'll talk about where bhakti falls within these so we could consider there are the conservatives Mm. then there are the leftists the left and then there are the liberals mm. i'll explain why i'm putting the left separately so in the conservative the focus is quite a bit on hierarchy now why on hierarchy because there is a existing system 
and within that system you have a particular place so hierarchy leads to a sense of duty on a positive sense that you know the, for the world to function there has to be everybody has to play their roles in society and that any functional social society will have to have some ordering system and within that okay you fit here this is your role so duty or responsibility this is what this is where you are this is what you are meant to do that is the primary emphasis within within the, the conservative thought system now within the leftist thought system the primary value is equality that there often the leftist is a reaction to the conservative that when there is hierarchy emphasized then they feel that oh you know there is discrimination there is exploitation so that is the negative side of hierarchy that when there is hierarchy there can be domination there can be tyranny and there can be exploitation that comes because of that so so within the leftist equality everybody should be equal hmm. now equality you now this is something which innately ap appeals to us that yeah actually everybody should be equal nobody should be discriminated against so when there is equality the positive of it that is that there is opportunity there's a rigid hierarchy then some people at the top may get all the opportunities people at the bottom may not get all the opportunities so that is their value but the problem with equality see here what you're talking about is that each of these values has its importance but then that value becomes the sole value krishna talks about this as in 18.22 knowledge in the mode of ignorance it is a very curious concept because normally we think of knowledge and ignorance as opposite things isn't it it's when knowledge increases ignorance decreases that is the normal expectation but when krishna is saying knowledge in the mode of ignorance what it means is the more our knowledge increases the more our ignorance also ign increases <laughs> that means we get knowledge of only a particular fraction of reality hmm? so yattu krutsnavad ekasmin karye saktam ahetukam so one thing is made into everything hmm. so when one thing ekasmin krutsnavad one thing is made into everything so for example this is how biases come up that say i may have had a negative imp in, uh, negative interaction with a person from a particular community maybe a particular religion particular race particular nationality particular region maybe that person cheated me that person was very calculative money minded manipulative and that person cheated me now my experience is real but from that experience when i generalize and say all people people from that community are like this then that is a bias and no community is a homogeneity no community every community has different kinds of people so bias means what happens one thing is my experience and everything means it's a universal truth so from my experience when i extra extrapolate it to universal truth absolute truth that's when it becomes a bias so when i'm talking about knowledge in the mode of ignorance say when hierarchy is made the sole value then the problem is it can very easily lead to tyranny now if equality is made the sole value that can lead to incompetence why incompetence because by the nature of the world talent is not equally distributed isn't it some people are say better at music than others now if we say let everybody have equal opportunity to sing that's fine but not everybody is equally good at singing 
when some people start singing everybody wants to wants to continue hearing and they say let the let the hearing never stop let the singing never stop some other people start singing and people think when will the singing stop <laughs> so when when we cook for a feast now not everybody is an equally good cook so if it's equality when equality becomes the only value it can very easily lead to incompetence because everybody is not equally good at all things so coming to the point of gender gender equality is considered to be like a unquestioned value in today's world and yes as compared to gender discrimination uh, that is natural understanding but there there is a difference between the genders and say the male biology the female biology is different only say women can have children and women are naturally more interested say in people in relationships men are more interested generally in things propa talks about the male female psychology being different he's talking about it from one perspective that is of the hierarchy but there are fundamental differences so in the scandinavian countries they have complete they did social engineering to have total equality in terms of education is that so women grow up with the idea that education is that you can do everything that men can do and yet they found that even when all social opportunities are equal there are men who generally gravitate toward jobs like engineering women gravitate toward jobs like nursing women gravitate toward jobs where they can more interact with people Hmm? so now this does not apply to all women there will always be ex- exceptions but there is basically in the in the dharma shastra is described that there are male and female and there is the masculine energy and there is the feminine energy now it is not that males or have all the masculine energy and females have all the feminine energy no with respect to individual males and individual females no it could be that say there could be a small amount of feminine energy in a male and there could be some amount of masculine energy in a female so the individuality the variation will always be there but overall there are certain trends so the point i'm making over here is that equality when it is made in the supreme virtue it is not in respect to gender with respect to everything it denies reality because talents are differently distributed and actually if you consider a talent in one is a blessing for everyone if we consider a sports match basketball or cricket or athletics when one player makes a spectacular move the whole audience thousands and thousands jump up and applaud but because not everyone can do that and when that person does something spectacular during dancing somebody does a spectacular dance you know, some children so many countries have this america has got talent britain has got talent india has got talent why it's it's not because all indians don't have the same number of ta- same kind of talent so when some kid is a prodigy and say five year old ch- kid sings with a spectacular voice you know, it's stunning it's thrilling so if we make equality the absolute virtue the problem is it will lead to suppression of talent it will lead to competent people who could and should be leaders not having the opportunity for leadership so this is what happened in the leftist governments and in, in the educational system they tried to have that all students should get equal marks and what should be equal marks the top student the bottom student let's average them and what is the average that is the marks for all students in class but the result of that the top students are thinking even if i study i'm not going to get any special marks so why should i study and the bottom students are thinking even without study i'm going to get better marks than what i deserve so why should i study so equality alone is not enough now liberals they focus on their primary value is autonomy autonomy means i should be allowed to do what i want to do hmm? now now autonomy to some extent it's it's positive is that when there is autonomy people can take initiative people have space 
Every, otherwise, people can feel suffocated. Now, autonomy and equality are slightly different. So, left is sometimes left and liberal are equated. But the left and liberal are not exactly the same thing. Liberal means I need to, ha I'm liberal, I want to have my space to do what I want to do. Hmm? So, people can take initiative and do what they want. But the problem with this is if everybody wants autonomy, say if you are cooking for a feast and everybody says, I'll cook what I want. And everybody cooks sweet rice and nobody cooks rice. <laughs> there will be a problem. You know, when we work, in, we live as a society. And if autonomy is the only thing that is, employ, is emphasized, that will lead to chaos. Because we have to work together unitedly. So the point I'm making is that, I don't want to go further into this political philosophies, but the principle is, there is a value that is of value. But the problem is, when that value is made the supreme value, then it becomes a problem. So like for in India, the caste system was there. The caste system, there's hierarchy. But when the hierarchy was made the only thing, then it became exploitative. It led to discrimination. So, for a functional, soci functional society, all three are important. So, the idea is basically, if you move upwards, as in our spiritual perspective, so hierarchy, equality, autonomy. Ultimately, they are meant to heal us. Heal means, ultimately, we have to develop love. So, for us, the Bhagavatam also very clearly says, Varanashram. What is the purpose of Varanashram? Varanashram Acharvata Purushena Parhapuman Vishnur Aradhite Pantha Nanya Tattoshakaranam That the only purpose of Varanashram is to satisfy Lord Vishnu. And if anything, any kind of hierarchy, if it does not lead to the development of love, like in this verse, that the Menacha, Madhuraya, all those are described. But Vishrambhena, ultimately intimacy, love has to be developed. So whether we start from hierarchy as emphasis, whether we start from equality as emphasis, whether we start from autonomy as emphasis, the essential point is we need to develop love. For us, love for the Lord, that is the most important thing. One of the purposes that Prabhupada also said of the Krishna consciousness movement is to help people come closer to each other and closer to to the Lord. So, if we emphasize any value, either be it hierarchy, equality or autonomy, so much that ultimately love is not developed, then that will be a problem. So now, uh, what does that mean for all of us? I'll conclude with one last point. That for us on the journey to love, what do we do in today's moment? Now, I came from India. I was introduced to Bhakti in a very, very uh, conservative, hierarchical kind of uh, Brahmacharya ashram. Then, last 10 years, I have been traveling abroad, uh, uh, especially in the Western world. And I have seen that every place has its own mood, its own ethos. And Prabhupada, in one sense, wanted it like that. Prabhupada wanted each center to be largely autonomous. Prabhupada wanted to a large extent Krishna consciousness to be decentralized. And when there was too much centralization, too much hierarchy, for example, when uh, some of the devotees decided to make it called like a corporation, and it says we will centralize all the funds at one place, from everywhere the funds will come and then we will allot the funds. And Prabhupada actually had the UBC suspended at that time. He said, you know, you, all the temple president deal, deal with me directly. He said, too much centralization, he says it will kill the initiative for devotees. So, for us, in our present situation, we may be in a particular part of the world where the hierarchy may be more or the hierarchy might be less. But I'll talk about three broad principles by which, according to Desha Kala Patra, that we can find the way in which we can develop love for Krishna. The first principle is listen. Listen is Shravan. We need to you know, listen so that we can understand how to practice bhakti. So listen also means to some extent here to obey. Ob in any field that we go, initially we need to learn. And that learning happens by listening. So listen basically to how to practice bhakti. 
the principles of bhakti, the practices of bhakti, we need to listen. So at least initially, in any field we go, some amount of hierarchy is required. But while we are listening, no, we can also be learning. Now, listening, learning means what? Here it's not just, uh, learning is about ourselves. What are, what are the talents that I have been given? What are the gifts that I have? So the, this is the theme which you have talked about previously, last time also when I had come. That we all have our guna and our karma. So guna refers to the things we feel good doing. When we have the quality for doing something, we feel content doing those things. When say, somebody has a talent for music, then say when they are they're just learning some music, singing some songs, even hearing some music, they feel content. If somebody has a gift for cooking, just feel this is what I'm, I'm meant to do. <laughs> then the karma is things we are good at. See, this is where we talk about competent. A lot of people may find music good, they feel good, but that doesn't mean that they are good at music themselves. Right? Lot of, so, if ideally we can find something in the intermediate of both of these, what I, am, I feel content doing and what I am competent doing, then that is the area where we can find our lifelong service. Uh, the service where we can make the most contribution. And traditionally, the purpose of hierarchy, see the guru was meant to be with the disciple and observe the disciple and understand what was the nature of the disciple and thereby engage the disciple. Now, nowadays we live in an environment where between the authority figure and the subordinates, that level of interaction might not be there. But still, we learn by our observation, we learn by consulting others. So when we are listening, it is meant to also help us for uh, developing our self-observational skills. So basically what happens is when we are listening, listening means we are following, obeying initially, that also this takes us from rajas or tamas to a certain level of sattva. So otherwise, what happens is that when, if without listening to authority, we start, we start looking at, uh, learning about ourselves. We may equate ourselves with our lowest desires. I want to do what I want to do. But what do I want to do? I want to watch TV and drink and do things like that. Well, we don't want to identify ourselves or reduce ourselves to our lowest desires. A certain level of discipline, a certain level of inner cleansing, purification, that helps us to learn. I understand more about myself. And then beyond that, we can start looking for opportunities. Opportunities to take initiative, to serve according to the gifts that we have been given. So ideally speaking, the purpose of our movement is not just to impose hierarchy. It is to inspire devotees to take responsibility for serving Krishna. And it's one anecdote in the memories of Srila Prabhupada where Rochan Prabhu is in London and he asks Prabhupada, uh, London at that time is the headquarters, I'll conclude this anecdote, that, that that's the headquarters of the European outreach and devotees from Europe, from Netherlands, from different parts, from France, from England, they're come. they all reporting to Prabhupada how the service was going. So Rochan, he, he says to Prabhupada that, Prabhupada, everybody has something to do for you. Please give me some service. And Prabhupada, uh, this is the time when our movement is transiting. Initially, Prabhupada knew everyone personally as the movement started becoming bigger. Uh, Prabhupada couldn't know everyone personally. So Prabhupada says, what, do you, what would you like to do? Prabhupada said, whatever, he said, whatever you tell me, I'll do. No, what would you like to do? No, Prabhupada, he thought, maybe this is a test from Prabhupada. Whatever you want, I'll do. Prabhupada became grave and he says, he says, understand our philosophy. Find out what you like to do and do it for Krishna. 
So find out what you like to do and do it for Krishna. So this is where each one of us needs to take initiative. We want to serve in a way that we can sustain our service. So that is the hierarchy important? The hierarchy's purpose is ultimately to firstly help us develop love, uh, to help us direct ourselves toward Krishna, to love Krishna and then to guide us how we can live in a way that we can love Krishna. Now to what extent that hierarchy will be relevant in our particular context, how we can negotiate that hierarchy, that is something which every individual needs to find their way. The Gita says don't disturb people's minds but engage them according to a way that is doable for them. Na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam Joshayet sarva karmani vidvan yukta samachara So based on our particular upbringing now each one of us may find that for us uh, hierarchy may be very important. I need someone to tell me what I should be doing. I can move forward. For some of us equality may be more important. For us autonomy may be more important. So we, within bhakti there is scope for all of these values. But from wherever we are our focus needs to be on healing ourselves. We don't become campaigners for maintaining hierarchy. We don't become activists seeking equality. We don't become missionaries or canvassers of autonomy. We are proponents ultimately of the path of love. Proponents of bhakti. And each person can take the individual initiative to find out how best they can advance towards the path of developing love and the institution and the authorities therein are, can also help that individual to help uh, to move towards the path of love. So I'll summarize what I discussed. So we started, our topic was about high, importance of hierarchy in bhakti and I broadly discussed three points. So first of all I talked about non-hierarchical examples in bhakti. So three things, Dhruva Maharaj and Narad Muni, then Srila Prabhupada in New York as contrasted with Srila Prabhupada in San Francisco and Srila Prabhupada with disciples as contrasted with Srila Prabhupada with life members. So there is, there are examples of non-hierarchical interactions also. Not that the hierarchy was eliminated but it was substantially subordinated and then I talked about the political philosophy and how we want to avoid knowledge in the mode of ignorance where each political philosophy it has its driving value so we don't want any of these driving values to become the sole value in bhakti so that is what can lead to problems so we discuss three the three where first we discuss the conservative worldview where hierarchy is emphasized and the problem, uh, the positive of that is that when hierarchy uh, is there, the train, and there is order that can be maintained, there can be, we discuss the positive of each of these, the negative of each of these, I won't go into this. Then we discuss the left worldview where equality is emphasized. Now equality also has its positive but each, it has negative where incompetence can result. Then we discuss the liberal worldview where that autonomy is emphasized. Mm, that has positive, but again it also has its negative. So what our focus is, that from each of these, ultimately we want to go towards the, we want to heal ourselves, go towards the path of love. And the way in our particular situation, within our moment, we can go towards the path of love, we focus first on listening. Okay, listen to understand, to basic principles and practices of bhakti then so listening about bhakti then learning about ourselves in terms of our guna and our karma so then what are my gifts and then after that we are looking for opportunities according to our particular place and our particular situation how best we can serve in this way from wherever we are and whatever be the hierarchical structure, we can find our way to move toward Krishna. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच हरे कृष्णा एनी क्विक क्वेश्चन और कमेंट्स यस देवर थ्रो Hare Krishna Prabhu very wonderful class harmonizing so many different principles and i just have a question regarding kind of the state of iskon nowadays it could be a potentially controversial question but i feel you're doing a really good job kind of harmonizing these confidential uh controversial subjects there is, seems to be a very strong factionalization in the movement nowadays strong <coughs> fractionalization yeah amongst these different value systems yeah and many times what we see is not an attempt to kind of communicate but echo chamber echo chambers amongst those particular groups where they're kind of just echoing this the systems which they believe in mm. without kind of creating room for other people to speak and if there is someone there they're basically singled out or ostracized in that particular discussion how do we create a culture in which these different value systems can communicate work together and ultimately become effective in expanding the movement for shila prabhupad because shila prabhupad often said the only thing which can destroy this movement isn't outside influence but internal influences yeah it's difficult question or a difficult situation i'll talk about three things first first is that if you look at history hmm, what is happening in our moment is maybe dis- maybe difficult and distressing but it's not unprecedented every tradition has these these kind of confrontations and conflicts so it's we take solace from that in fact in the christian tradition the current pope is considered highly liberal and there are people who the conservatives are way against him in the christianity they have the idea of the lost sheep and then the the jesus and the representative of jesus the priests or who they are the supposed to people who are supposed to find uh, the sheep and get them back so there are the conservatives who call the current pope as the lost shepherd <laughs> not the lost sheep but the lost shepherd so the idea is that this is common in fact the polarization in the church is so much nowadays that that say generally in any religion people want to marry within the faith the bible says don't be unequally yoked but the polarization is so much that that say conservative catholics not even christians conservative catholics will not marry a liberal catholic so my understanding is to some extent first of all not only is it unprecedented we live in a world that is polarized so it's almost if i consider america florida or texas and here in, uh, california or new york it's almost a significant difference so we cannot live uh, in a transcendent bubble unaffected by the way the world is so it is unprecedented it is not unprecedented it happens everywhere it will happen in our moment also that's why there's no need to be too distressed about it now the second point is that always everywhere there will be moderates hmm. there will be extremists and when the extremists are there well, i am not using the word extremist in a necessarily a derogatory sense extremists is basically those who have the extreme adherence of an ideology they may not be violent they may be verbally violent they may be physically violent or they may just be not care for anyone else but there will be moderates and the moderates need to link together so there will be a risk that so a moderate conservative can actually talk with a moderate liberal a moderate leftist so we need to have those moderates and those voices need to come forward and from there the discussion will begin now the danger in that is that is like the moderates of a party of a moderate liberal wants to talk with the conservatives the problem could be that the conservatives say that you are too liberal and the liberals will say that you are being too conservative but then that is the service of every person see we all in one sense have to be like a mridanga mridanga is beaten from both sides but has to give out good sounds <laughs> so like that 
we who ever what where we are you know so when we are we are trying to share bhakti in a environment that is more liberal then the people will say hey your tradition is too conservative and people from within tradition in, will say that in trying to reach out to people you are being too liberal so there will be criticism but that is the expertise of the devotee the moderates that now how they can balance that but we need moderates and the last point i'll make is that our history of the tradition is change has always happened from the periphery it has rarely happened from the top down so if we consider when the gaudiya version of tradition was lost after the after chakravarti pad and others bhakti not thakur was not born in the gaudiya tradition you know he was born in the shakta tradition and he was outsider the gaudiya tradition had become largely uh largely ritualistic with the caste jati goswamis they focusing mostly on rituals and maintaining their positions again it had become a reflective of the caste hierarchy so bhakti nath thakur was on the fringe he was outsider who studied the tradition and who started presenting the tradition he took nominal initiation from a caste jati goswami but he got his primary inspiration from a vaishnava who was not in that hierarchical structure and he continued his out and then he brought about a change if we look at shila prabhupad also the prabhupad was at the periphery of um, of the gaudiya math so when the gaudiya math fractured for whatever reasons prabhupad started it again from the periphery so the by using the word periphery i'm talking about that our tradition is testament testimony to the fact that an individual can makes significant contributions so rather than worrying about the state of the movement uh, we can focus on trying to do the best in whatever corner we are at and from there things will grow the prabhupad says that there is or prabhupad talked about the world geopolitical scene but that applies to our movement also prabhupad said there is no use of crying for world peace without the awakening of divine consciousness in the individual so we try to awaken the divine consciousness that means we say from where we are how can we move toward developing love for krishna and then if we create models that work so there could be a model which focuses on hierarchy and that works there could be a model that focuses on autonomy and that works so rather than criticizing those who are emphasizing autonomy and saying that you are deviating or those who are criticizing uh, Uh, those who are emphasizing hierarchy that you are deviating okay our movement is big enough let different people have different models and let's see what works falena parichayate if genuine devotees who are dedicated who can practice bhakti in the long run are developed then that's wonderful i think if we can focus more on the vertical growth rather than the horizontal conflict then what will happen is Uh, whoever is successful they will get their space and then others may also follow so in one sense we can say we as a movement are in uncharted territory that the exact situation that we are in is different from what during prabhupad's time there were two broad kinds of people as i mentioned there the disciples who were extremely dedicated and the life members who were mostly affiliated mm. and today what we have mostly are congregation members now we cannot because they have their jobs and careers and families you cannot expect the same thing that my disciples i mean they were full time disciples temple resident disciples mm-hmm. so we don't have that in today's world at the same time the congregation members are definitely way way more dedicated than what the life members were so how exactly in this uncharted territory we should move now we need to pray to prabhupada and krishna and seek for guidance but rather than claiming that my way is the only way hmm, we follow the way that we feel inspired by we feel inspired to follow and if things work then others will also adopt it yes so much please
Isn't it, wouldn't it be appropriate to think that the GBC is the governing body of ISCON and that whatever their mandates may be in terms of organization and management, uh, shouldn't we follow that particular principle? Yes, of course. See, and there are two things. Oh, thank you for bringing that point. Srila Prabhupada did institute the GBC. Now, if you consider in terms of hierarchy, Prabhupada had, Prabhupada was one person who was both, but currently in ISKCON, we have the gurus who are one chain of authority and the GBC is another chain of authority. And both are working in their ways to carry on Srila Prabhupada's mission. At the same time, the ground reality is that the gurus may have many, many disciples. The GBCs may also have many zones. So how much can the GBC specifically guide? How much can the GBC oversee? Now, Prabhupada did, certainly didn't want the GBC to micromanage. Now, I have talked with several GBC leaders and you have probably more experience than me, but to a large extent, the GBC has been caught in firefighting for most of the time. That some crisis comes up and we try to resolve the crisis. Now, like setting a vision, the vision casting has largely happened uh, more from individual leaders in their particular zones, whether they be gurus or temple leaders, that has come from them. And I'm, I can't think of many initiatives within our movement that actually came from the GBC down and then spread across. This is not to minimize the uh, importance of the GBC. The point is that the GBC is there is a, there's a particular state in which the GBC is right now. So certainly if certain, uh, some boundaries, uh, some extreme boundaries are crossed, then the GBC does come down and mandate and take care of things. But whether the GBC can actually do that in today's world, just like the, whether the gurus, if a disciple asks a guru, that, you know, what service should I do? Does the guru actually know the disciple and their nature sufficiently? So do, do the GBCs, know the dynamics of each place sufficiently. So, the, uh, from what I've heard is there are three kinds of uh, the GBC and local temple interactions that are like actively involved. This quite over, often when say the, at least I'm talking from my experience in India, that sometimes where the, the GBC is also the guru and the temple president is the disciple, then the GBC gives a vision and very strongly implements it. Mm -hmm. Then, so that, that's uh, like very actively involved. Then, then there is, uh, they are regularly informed. And that means, and then they give consent. That's the way where reports come up. And then there, there are GBC also who are like, just, they are like, basically like traveling preachers. They come and they visit, they talk with a few people at that time. So I would say that if the GBC expands substantially, now they're trying to create the regional secretaries and other things. So then maybe that will work. But uh, the, how exactly things uh, should be and how exactly things are right now, that's varying significantly. And so I think that a lot of initiative depends on the individual leaders at particular places. And then finally on individual devotees to find out how best they can serve. You would like to add something? This is just my thoughts. Yeah, I, I think that's, that, that has a place, what you're saying. I, I, I agree with that. But then I think that another principle would be something that you mentioned about love. So there should be a principle of love also in terms of how we deal with even the GBC situation and, and in, inter, interrelations. So I think that principle of love is yeah. a very important factor. And then I think that love should be focused on uh, you know, the love that Prabhupada gave us in terms of his teaching and what he actually wanted us to institute mm -hmm. and carry on and, you know, press on. So I think that uh, love is an important issue because if you love each other, as you're mentioning, then the cooperation is, is a normal thing. We're talking about a husband and wife. If, if a husband and wife don't love each other, then how can they coexist? How, how is it possible to be in the same place, in the same house, with a woman or a man that you don't love? 
Mm. It, it, there's no function there. It's, it's a dysfunctional situation. So I think with us also, love is an important ingredient in terms of our activity. And it should be love based on the principles that Prabhupada gave us. Because he gave it to us out of love, out of love for you know, us. Yeah. He, he gave it to us that way. So I think uh, love is a very important issue. Uh, and I don't mean like sentimental love. I, I, don't, I don't refer to that. I, I think love means, and like you talked about activity and, and principles and conservatism and liberalism, uh, you know. So all those things, they may be in a particular person, but if the person, like, like in America, if you love America, you know, you, <laughs> whoever, whoever you are, the love of America, push on America, the mm. greatest, the best, strongest, everything. If you love America, and if you don't love America, then you won't do that. That's beautifully put. Let's quickly quick reflection on this. There are two things, or three things rather. There is action, and with respect to the actions that different people may take, this is answering your question also. They may be very different. Mm -hmm. So the way, say, outreach might be done in, in India might be very different from what it is in America. Mm -hmm. Now that action arises from certain intelligence. The intelligence involves assessing the situation. So we may disagree with actions. We may even disagree with the judgments, the intelligence. Exactly. But at a basic level, law means we agree with the motivation. You know, you are here to serve Prabhupada, I am here to serve Prabhupada. But what happens is quite often from questioning actions to questioning intelligence, we start questioning motivation itself. And we start saying, you know, you are here to, to just gain cheap followers. You are here to aggrandize your own power. And you are simply using Prabhupada and Iskon to boost your own position. Now, is that possible? Unfortunately, it's possible. But is that probable? Well, if a moon person has been practicing, if somebody simply wanted power, you know, they could just go outside the movement and gain power also. Somebody, so I think if we can at least have enough love to trust that a person's motivation is good, yeah. this person wants to serve Shila Prabhupada, then what happens is that so there is can there can be agreement with respect to actions that's great but that's we are in such different situations it's not going to be a possible but at least your actions are intelligible to me that okay this is what you're thinking i don't agree with it but when we start doubting the motivation itself then the actions even become unacceptable so within the within the chain of disagreement i would say that there needs to be some attempt that um, there are actions which are lovable. Oh, I love what you do. There are ac actions that are appreciable. Okay, this is good. There are actions that are intelligible. Okay, I understand where you are coming from. There are actions which are acceptable. Mm -hmm. That you know, I don't understand why you are doing this. I don't agree with your judgment of the situation. But I accept that you are well-intentioned. So let's see how this goes. But quite often, we go below this, and this is where name calling starts happening, ad hominem attacks start happening, because we start questioning the motivation of people. But let's try to avoid questioning the motivation. That's where I think your point of emphasis on love comes in. Am I reflecting your point, bro? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have maybe one, maybe one, a little bit? There are two, three over there, I don't know. Mataji? Okay. I, I, I loved your presentation. It was, it, was, it was well thought out and beautiful. I thought love was the right word, but uh, love might be thought of as liberal, so it, it also needs respect or honor. Or okay, yes. So I was using the word love in more the sense of devotion. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So you were thinking it's, it's more of bhakti. bhakti. So maybe I could use the word devotion. So instead of I had used the acronym HEAL, H E A L, we could make it HEAD, HEAD, H E A D. You want to be headed in the right direction. So ultimately, yeah, love can be seen as too sentimental. You know, people can have the idea that anything goes in the name of love. 
it is a well taken point our purpose is ultimately devotion yeah i thought you meant bhakti <laughs> yeah thank you yes Adibol, Guru, the questions presented were extremely intelligible. Your answers were extremely intelligible. However, being involved and delved into both Krishna consciousness and Christianity I can see the correlation. Guru Dave, according to Bhakti Yoga, would be the head of the shepherd for the lost sheep. Yeah. Because the devotee would be, in essence, the sheep. You have yeah. your staff. The Christians have their Jesus with the staff. According to some of the principles of Christianity, the tradition, the old tradition, the new tradition is, is that Jesus was one of the greatest gurus or sannyasis that ever existed. Disciplic succession, I'll get to my question. The hierarchy of disciplic succession from to Kaur, to Prabhupada, mm -hmm. to the gurus that we have today, and the disciplic succession from Adam to David to Jesus. All these come into play, as far as I can see, bhakti meaning love, and then agapi meaning love. So we have a hierarchy in all systems of traditional religion, I would think. Mm. And then the basis of all of them would be divine love. Yes. Now, he was asking about... Okay, so just a minute. Just so that I can process all this. Is this a comment or is it a question? Oh, well, it's, the question would be, in the hierarchy and the scheme of things, the GBC, the guru, the disciple, how would you describe love, lovable, uh, accountable, intelligible, acceptable, if it doesn't start with Krishna, Radha, Prem itself for love, then what is the purpose of the tradition? Yes, true. So, our Prabhupada very clearly said it is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And it is not the International Society for Varanashram re-establishment. It is not the International Society for Feminism. It is not the International Society for Male, male Chivalry. So, the idea is that we have to keep what Prabhupada established. If you look at the seven purposes of ISKCON that Shri Prabhupada gave, they are very broad. You know, the, the Prabhupada was very far-sighted. He did not get caught into any particular nitty-gritty. They were distributing books, building temples, having living a simpler life, and then uh, fostering the correcting the balance of his material and spiritual values. So that purpose of developing love of for Krishna, of fostering Krishna consciousness, and broad pathways for that is what Prabhupada has focused on. See, Prabhupada does not focus on Varanashram. Prabhupada does not focus on gender roles. Prabhupada even does not talk about, within the seven purposes of his con, he does not talk about many of the things which have become like political hot potatoes today, where you know, they have become huge sources of conflict. So, within the ambit of living, faith, living faithful to Prabhupada and pursuing love for Krishna, I think there is a scope there is enough scope for different devotees to pursue Krishna consciousness in their own ways. You know, one of my friends is a bit, he's a, he's a Prabhupada disciple. He's a, he told me, don't quote my name, but he said, he said, the, we often quote Prabhupada, build a house in which 
the whole world can live. So he said, Prabhupada built a house in which the whole world can fight. <laughs> now what he meant by that, he was not being sarcastic, he was saying that you can fight inside the house, you don't have to leave the house. <laughs> there can be different devotees living in different places, trying out different ways of pursuing Krishna Bhakti. Okay, so thank you very much. Yes. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki Jai Gaur Premani.